This is a special message. It's for a vast audience, not only those that are here, those that are watching, but those that will catch it later. It's going to minister to people deeply. I love what God's going to do through this word. It's entitled, Honor the Lord. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter writes and says that Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And it just simply says resisting, steadfast in the faith, stay in the faith. Do what you know to do for God. God's got you. Satan loves to roar, but Jesus has taken his teeth out. He's toothless. He is. And he loves to intimidate us, does he not? The thing about Satan is he uses people and he uses situations, physical things, to intimidate us. And if you're not a strong Christian, if you don't have strong faith in the invisible God, it's going to be hard for you to look at physical things that are coming against you and believe at the same time the invisible God is going to protect you against these physical things. Like the men of, in the army of Israel where they stood in that valley and Goliath was defying them, he was physical. They were all intimidated, weren't they not? It says that all the men were shaken in fear, even Saul. Nobody wanted to take Goliath on. And so the Lord has given some wisdom and understanding through his spirit to me, so I'm going to share with you. 1 Kings chapter 19, let's pick it up, verse 1. It's called, Honor the Lord. And Ahab, the king of Israel, told Jezebel, his wife, all that Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets that consisted of 450 false prophets, 400 prophets of Baal, 850 prophets he killed in all that had the Jews, Israel, under their spell of witchcraft, and they were torn between Baal worship and worshiping the God of Israel. And so God had a showdown on Mount Carmel with his prophet Elijah. And so Elijah, uh, I'm sorry, Ahab is giving his wife Jezebel, who fed the false prophets and prophets of Baal at her table. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me, and more so, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, talking about the prophets that were dead, by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, that was a message, y'all. You don't see words, but it says when he saw that. He arose and what? Ran for his life, went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. And he himself went a day's journey, isolation. That's what fear can do. It can cause you to get in isolation so Satan can devour you. Went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough now, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Very down on himself, isn't he? Then as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. I find it very interesting that this prophet is running for his life, and God sends an angel with a cake to give Elijah. Now, I don't know. If I were Elijah, I might want God to send somebody, maybe an angel, to Jezebel and have her taken out, not a cake. Can I get a witness? And I got to thinking about that. Why would God send an angel to Elijah to give him a cake when he's running for his life? Because Psalm 23 says, The Lord prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Those enemies are not to to come and to consume us, we are to consume the cake while God takes care of our enemies as long as we're doing what God called us to do. Can I get a witness? It's the intimidation factor. Throughout my existence, my short existence on earth, <laughs> there have been times when 
you could feel the presence of fear in the air. It just, it's like it comes in seasons. It wasn't an illusion because people around me could sense the fear or something foreboding as well. It was just hanging in the air. Don't forget that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, according to Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. He named or gave the title of prince of the power of the air under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to Satan to describe his power. He's the prince of the power of the air. Have you noticed that the ones who own television stations, networks, satellites, newspaper, internet things, they're all secular. They're all lost. And Satan controls what comes across the airways, what comes across in print, because Satan is the prince of the power of the air. The word air there in the uh, Greek is circumambient, which means surrounding, enclosing, or being on all sides, encompassing. I want you to think about that. He's able to encompass us because he's the prince of the power of the air. He is not omnipresent, but there's plenty of demons that hang out with him. Without people realizing what is happening to them, people in the world, they will have or experience spiritual encounters, and this encounter will affect them, but they won't acknowledge or even recognize that it's a spiritual encounter that they're having but will dismiss their feelings as being just that, a feeling. You ever had feelings? I mean, we used to go through neighborhoods sometimes driving, and, and Debbie would experience some spiritual uh, encounters, and her ears would start aching because she picked up on the demonic activity in those neighborhoods. And people will pick up on things that are not spiritually minded, that are spiritual because we're spirit beings. We're created in the image and likeness of God, are we not? And, and the gifts and the calling are irrevocable. God puts those in you before you were born, whether you saved or not. you got gifts and callings. You have abilities. And so people will pick up on these spiritual experiences, but they will dismiss them as just being a feeling and miss what is going on, but they will be negatively impacted by what's going on in the atmosphere over them. You ever gone into some areas where you just walked through it or maybe you drove through and you feel heavy oppression over that area? That's, that's demonic. It's spiritual, y'all. It's real. This is how the demonic world operates. They are able to affect people through our senses. If we're not discerning the spirits that are affecting us, they can sway or affect us, and we won't realize what is happening to us. It's happening right now. That's why God's giving me this message, to, to wake people up to the spiritual that is going on around them. Just look at the negative impact that Jezebel's threat against the life of Elijah had on this powerful prophet of God. One man takes out 850 prophets false prophets and prophets of Baal. He does that on Mount Carmel and, and, and doesn't even break a sweat. And through that encounter, turns the whole heart of Israel back to God and away from Baal worship. And now he's running from Jezebel's threat, y'all. Even though she threatened to end his life within 24 hours, Elijah prayed to God that he would allow him to die to avoid being killed. See, y'all got that. That's what, she, what he was praying. Jezebel is about to kill me. Father, Lord, I'm no better than my fathers. Just go ahead and take me out. Let me die so I don't have to face being killed. That's what he's praying, y'all. This brings up a very powerful point about the fallen human nature. It's not so much that we're afraid to die. Think about this. But it's that we fear people's wrath. We fear wrath. That's why people are afraid to die. 
Elijah trusted. Matter of fact, for a Christian, because we're saved and we're protected from wrath, when we leave this, when we close our eyes, our spirit eyes are open and we're in God's presence in heaven. We don't see death. Our body sees death. Our soul and our spirit go instantly into the presence of God. Elijah trusted God to the point that he asked God to end his life. But he was terrified to face death at the hands of Jezebel's men. It was a fear of wrath that haunted Elijah. You ever done something good and got in trouble for doing it? If you have, you might be a preacher. We do good things for God, like Paul and Silas, you know. The little girl has is, is got this spirit of divination using her to tell people their fortune, to tell them people their, their future, and she's doing this, and, and men are exploiting this gift in this girl and, and making great money off of the things that she is telling people about where they are in their life. And, and Paul and Silas are walking through the streets and ministering the word of God. And she's following them and saying, these are servants of the most high God. Listen to them. And then one day, Paul gets enough of this little girl and casts that spirit out. It's gone. And the money makers who are getting money rich off of this little girl's gifts and exploiting her, they get mad. And they go to the magistrate and they filed charges against Paul and Silas for setting this girl free. But, you know, they're not going to use a spiritual reason because it won't hold up in a court of law. This guy is robbing us of our money. And so, what did they do? They arrested Paul and Silas, beat them without mercy, threw them in the inner prison like they were common criminals, and all they did was deliver a child from a demonic possession. It's interesting that we can do good things for God and get severe repercussions. But here's the thing about that. Elijah did a great thing. God used him to turn the entire nation back to him. And for that, he gets a threat put out on his life. You're doing something good for God, and in response, you're put on the hit list. Like a mob hit. That's the same thing. It's intimidation. And you think, my God, I was just doing something for God. I was doing something for good. But the enemy will twist it, y'all. And then you get in trouble. And this makes Christians afraid to do anything for God. You know I'd find your nest. Amen or oh me. But the Bible says don't fear wrath. We're not appointed unto wrath. We're appointed unto salvation. Turn with me to Genesis 3. Let's go back to the root. We always got to go back to the root. If you don't put an axe to the root, it's going to grow back. I cut down a butter, butterfly bush because it's too big. Cut it down to the ground. Guess what? It's growing back. I said the devil is a liar. You got to put the axe to that thing. So anytime we're going to find out something wrong with us, we got to go back to our mom and daddy, Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, verse 6, you know the story. The serpent has come and lied to Eve about the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge, good and evil. He says, you will not die. Look in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and they gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked, self-conscious, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. They hid themselves from who? God. Among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord called to Adam and said, Where are you? What happened to you? Shortly after Adam and Eve committed sin, they heard the voice of the Lord God approaching them in the garden. When they heard him speak, fear struck their hearts. For the first time since they were created, they had fear in their hearts. And it happened when they heard God's voice. So in response to hearing God's voice, what did they do? They covered themselves up, hid behind a bunch of bushes, so God couldn't find them. How did that work? 
God found them and said, where are you? Uh, God, you're looking at us. Why are you asking, where are you? It's spiritual. Where's that relationship we had? What were, what were they afraid of concerning the Lord? What were they afraid of? Did God give them the spirit of fear since it was God's presence that made them sense fear? No. But isn't it interesting? People do fine until they get in church. Then they get afraid, especially when God's presence shows up. And it's not that God causes us to have fear. It's that God's presence causes fear to manifest. God's presence causes demons to manifest. Go over to Africa sometime and preach you a good Holy Ghost revival. Man, they be coming out of the woodwork at you. Because they practice the occult and witchcraft over there. And demons manifest when the anointing comes out. So God did not give them the spirit of fear. It's that God's presence caused the fear to manifest. God didn't give them that spirit. But their fear was a manifestation of God's presence coming toward them. And it exposed the sin that was in their heart and their conscience that made them be afraid of God. They had a guilty conscience. They had a heart with sin, and that made them be afraid of God, their, their creator. They feared God's wrath, not so much his presence. This brings us to the point of today's message from God for you all, those that are watching. If they had resisted sin by being submitted to God, and kept his commandments that he, as he had commanded Adam to do, keep the garden, protect the garden. Would they have feared God if they'd kept the commandments and had not sinned? Would they? No. They would not have feared God. But because they sinned, they had fear. So now we're getting something that is tangible that we can think about, understand and comprehend how fear works. It works through sin. And it's associated with, the fear is, the repercussions are the wrath that comes as a result of sin. Now we're getting somewhere. See if we can study these things out by the Spirit of God, understand how things work, then we will have knowledge. And when you know the truth, the truth will make you free from the intimidation factor. Oh, this is going to be good. Y'all may vote me as pastor of the year when this is done. The reason they were afraid and hid from the Lord was brought on because Adam and Eve chose not to honor God or His Word. See, not honoring God and His Word gives place to fear. They followed their own lust and did what pleased them, just like this generation is doing to a large degree, and this caused them to be overtaken by fear. Fear will make you be afraid of God. Fear will make you be afraid of God. But at the same time, fear won't make you afraid of sin. The same people that are afraid to be in church on Sunday are not afraid to be in a bar on Saturday night. Isn't it interesting how people are afraid to be in God's presence, but they're not afraid to be around sinners who are sinning? Now, let's think about that. God is the life of God is our life. He is the God of living, is he not? He's the God of living and not the dead, Jesus said. And sin kills, it destroys, does it not? And we are more comfortable around the thing that kills us than we are the one who gives us life. Now we're getting somewhere. It's a mindset. Exodus 20. So they gave place to that. That became a root or a stronghold in all of humans' lives from Adam even till now. Nothing has changed concerning fear. And so we get to the Mount Sinai where God is going to hand down his law, the Ten Commandments. And in verse 18, it says this. Now all the people, talking about the Jews that were brought out of bondage out of Egypt, all the people witnessed the thunderings the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet. God likes a party, don't he? The mountain smoking. And when they saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. They were afraid of him. 
And they were his chosen people. And they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Isn't that interesting? They thought they would die if God spoke to them. God's the one that gave them life. God is the one who delivered them, y'all. Do you see the mindset? That's what fear does. If God talks to us, we're going to die. So let's go find a place where a man or a woman can talk to us so we don't have to hear God. <laughs> but you say you worship the God that kill you if he talks to you. See, not thinking things through. And Moses said to the people, do not fear. What did he tell them? Don't be scared. For God has come to test you that his fear may be before you. Now, wait a minute, Moses. You're talking out both sides of your mouth. You first minute you say, don't fear. And then you say, God has come to make you fear. Isn't that what it says? But that's a different kind of fear. It's not the fear that comes on us by, because of sin and being wrong in God's sight. This kind of fear that God gives you is the fear that makes you respect God for who he is. And this fear will keep you from sin. Now, one fear comes because we have sin, but the fear of the Lord will keep us from sin. Now we're getting somewhere. See, God didn't descend on Mount Sinai to scare the devil out of the Jews. But it scared them because God does not give us the spirit of fear. Sin does. God came down to show his power and his greatness. The mountain trembled, didn't it? There was smoke on the mountain. There was a, tr a trumpet. But he did that to show his great power and strength to his chosen people so that the fear of the Lord would be before them and his fear would prevent them from sinning against the Lord. Now, when we have godly reverential fear, we will honor God in our hearts and we will not have the fear that holds us in bondage. Therefore, we can, can conclude that Adam and Eve would not have sinned and would not have been afraid of the Lord's presence if they had only honored the Lord in their hearts. So what's the key to fear? Honor God. Now we're getting somewhere. Let me ask this question. While the Jews were, I mean, we're talking the entire nation, y'all. That's a lot of people there at the bottom of Mount Sinai. And they said, you go talk to God. Isn't that interesting? If he talks to us, we're going to die. But you go talk to him. That's like throwing the preacher to the wolves. <laughs> you go talk to him. Let me ask you this question. Didn't Moses go up on that mountain? And didn't he go into the presence of God? Was Moses afraid of God? No. Yet an entire nation of Jews were, right? Did he draw back in fear, Moses, when Pharaoh pursued them at the Red Sea? No. Did the Jews? They were not only afraid, they were very afraid, and they drew back from God. Did Moses draw back in fear at Mount Sinai as the, the presence of God came down and shook the earth? No. So there's a distinction between Moses and the Jews that we need to find out. What is it that Moses had that the Jews didn't have that he was not afraid of God? Amen. Here it is. In Exodus 3, you can read it later, when God's presence came down on a bush and the fire of God filled that bush, remember? But the bush did not burn. It says that he said, I will turn aside now and see why this bush is on fire, but it's not consumed. And when he turned and gave the bush his attention, God spoke to him out of the bush. When God spoke to him, he went back. It scared him. This experience frightened Moses, and he pulled back from God's presence, but God spoke to him again. And he saw what Moses did, and he says, Remove the sandals from your feet, because the ground that you're standing on is holy. And what did Moses do? He honored God. He took the sandals off his feet, and he stood there like a big man and took it straight from God. I brought, I've come to deliver my people. I'm going to send you back to Egypt, and you're going to deliver them out with a mighty hand. This is why Moses wasn't afraid of Pharaoh. This is why Moses wasn't afraid of God, because he honored God. See, see, 
See, see, there's a lot of ministers, there's a lot of political leaders, a lot of governmental leaders that are not honoring God in their hearts. And, and when Pharaoh wants to come out and do something, they tremble in their boots like King Saul and the, the armies of Israel down in the Valley of Elon. Can I get a witness? See, if you don't honor God in your heart, the things of this world are going to intimidate you and strike you with fear. But if you're honoring God, you're not going to have fear here because your fear is already in God to keep you from sin. Because you're honoring God, God is going to keep your heart so that you do not fear when trouble rises. Now we're getting somewhere. Now God is equipping us as men and women, young men and women of God, so that we know what we've got and what we need to do. And when we do what we're supposed to do and honor God, God honors us. And God gives us a spirit of boldness and courage and strong resolve that we can stand up against the impossible odds of a giant defying us and say, you uncircumcised for listing today, the Lord is going to, the Lord, not this, this uh, sling, not this rock, but the Lord is going to deliver you into my hands. See, that was boldness coming up out because David honored God on the backside of the desert keeping sheep. All you got to do is honor God. Just imagine, if you will, Christians, Honoring God. Yes. We honor God in our hearts. In everything that he commands us to do, we do it. And as a result of that, we don't have to take pharmaceutical drugs to calm our nerves and to deal with anxiety and fear because it won't be there because God will keep us. Wouldn't that be wonderful there, having no burdens to bear? Yes. Luke 22. Is this helping you? Line upon line, precept upon precept. Luke tw uh, 22. Let's look at verse 54 together. This is where Jesus is being tried. They've arrested him. They're fixing to put him to death. It says, having arrested Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. That same Peter, you know, that said earlier, I'm ready to go to prison and even die for you. Now he's following Jesus at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied Jesus, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Something happened to Peter, y'all. He's not that bold, arrogant Peter right now, is he? No. He shut down through fear. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Oh, Lord. Jesus hears the crowing of the rooster, knows what he's already said. He told Peter, when Peter says, I'm ready to go to prison and even die for you, he said, tonight you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. And immediately after Peter denies Jesus the third time, the rooster crows. A rooster told on him. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said to him, you'll deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Wow. Can anyone tell me why Simon had no power to protect Jesus, but instead he denied the Lord as Jesus had prophesied he would? Here's why 
Peter had no power. Do you remember when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane? That he instructed Peter, James, and John, his three top disciples. He said, watch and pray with me for how long? One hour. Now, what was the purpose of that? He didn't want them just to pray. He said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Did they watch and pray? No. Just like Adam, they did nothing but sleep. They all chose to dishonor the Lord during that hour, and they slept. This is the reason why Simon Peter had no spiritual fortitude or strength to stand up for Jesus at the judgment hall in the priest's house as they tried Jesus in a mock trial. Simon and the other ten disciples, Judas has already hanged himself, were all paralyzed by the spirit of fear, and every one of them denied Jesus. See, when, when God lays it on the pastor to call a prayer gathering and we say, God has said, come and pray, and four or five show up out of 100, 150 people, then the other 145 people that don't show up, they're dishonoring God. And then because they did not do what God told them to do and honor the word of the Lord in the house of God, then they enter into temptation because they did not honor God. And we thought the prayer gathering was just the pastor trying to get an ego trip, trying to work up something to get people in the house of God, when it was God saying, if you will, if you will pray in this season, I will spare you from what's about to come. But not everybody wants to do that, so they go ahead and enter into temptation. And then when that thing comes, then you got 145 scared sheep that are scared out of their hides, wanting to know, Pastor, what's going on? And five over there saying, I'll tell you what's going on. <laughs> right? That's what happened to Simon and the other disciples. He called a prayer gathering, Jesus did, and they didn't want to come. They slept through it. But when the temptation come, they fell for it. Isn't it interesting that God's work can fail, but Satan's work will prevail when we don't do what God says. Acts chapter 2. Let's get uh, Peter out of hot water, okay? Verse 14. But Peter, this is when, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit has come, the 120 are in the upper room, including the, the 11 disciples, and they're all praying in the Spirit as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so everybody hears their own, there's many Jews from different nations, have different uh, languages, and so they're all speaking. This 120 people are speaking by the orchestration of the Holy Spirit in their native tongue of the people that were there in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. And so they think that this, this group of people, these Pentecostals, are drunk on wine. So they're accusing them of being drunk in the middle of the day. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet, of, prophet Joel. And it came to pass in the last days, God said, that I will pour out my spirit upon uh, all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Upon my men servants and upon my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Now drop down to verse 22, please. Men of Israel, now this is Peter continuing his sermon on the day of Pentecost. Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put him to death. He's telling them like it is. Is he backing off? 
No, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he, Jesus, should be held by it. His body will not see corruption, the Bible said. Now drop down to verse 36. Again, Peter is still preaching. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified. See, he's telling them again. They did it. They, they blamed it on the Romans because the Jews were not allowed under the law to crucify somebody or to kill somebody on, on that day. So they, had to, they called the Roman government to do it. But he says, y'all did it southern language both lord and christ now when they had heard this they were what cut to the heart as said to peter and the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do and he says repent let every one of you be baptized in the name of jesus christ for the remission the removing of sins and you shall receive the gift of the holy spirit now let me ask you this question what happened to simon peter between jesus death and the day of pentecost that made him so bold toward the leaders and the men of Israel, all of Israel, the Bible says. He told the men that day the plain truth, straightforward, and without apology and without any fear, what they did to Jesus. How did he get that boldness? I mean, just 53 days later, he's denying Jesus. 53 days later, he is already getting up, and declaring the truth without apology, with boldness. That was a transformation, y'all. Instead of running, you turn around and face what you've been running from. See, that's what God is wanting to do to Christians. You're running from stuff, and God said, if you'll be still and face it, I will give you strength, and then I will fight your battle for you. But as long as you run, he can't fight for you, y'all. Quit running. Here's how Peter got his boldness back. People have confidence. You ever met a confident, you ever met an overconfident person? Man, they could do no wrong. They could do anything. They knew everything. There's a difference between confidence and assurance. See, I don't have confidence. When, when I'm not preaching, I'm not this. I'm hiding out somewhere. I'm chilling. I'm by myself. Because I'm introvert. But when the anointing comes on me, I'm anything but that. And people think this is me. And it's not. Matter of fact, I eat at a bistro. It's down in L.A.J. Uh, Pete, that, that's free. And uh, <laughs> Pete and Tammy, they watch me come in. been watching me come in for years. And so one day... I guess he found out I was on Facebook, and so he, he friended me, and we became friends on Facebook, became friends, and, and so he, he's at home one day, and he flips on, and he sees a video where I'm preaching. So he said, I'll check this dude out. <laughs> and so he, 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 he obviously checked out one of the hot sermons, because <laughs> it's like when he clicked on it, the hair just blew back. <laughs> and it's like, Tammy, come here, Look. Who is this guy? This ain't the dude that comes to our bistro. No, it's not. That's the anointing of God. See, when you honor God and God puts that boldness on, there's a boldness. You don't care what people think about you. All you want to know, are you saved? Are you going to heaven? Are you a sinner going to hell? He got his boldness back. He didn't care what they thought about him. It happened in John 21. After Jesus had appeared to the disciples three times, this was now the third time in John 21, Jesus confronted Simon about the sin in his heart head on. And it was after that encounter with the risen Lord that Peter recommitted his life to the Lord and the work that God had called him to, and God restored Peter. Peter had boldness on the day of Pentecost to preach the truth without compromise to the people because he was submitted to God. He honored God in his heart. He didn't sleep through the 10 days of prayer in the upper room. Read your Bible. 
Jesus walked with the disciples for 40 days, and after 40 days of showing signs and wonders and evidence that he had risen from the Lord, he says, tarry here in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. And they went into the upper room and began to pray for 10 days, and they endured. They couldn't pray one hour before Jesus died, but after he was risen, they prayed for 10 days. And because Peter was submitted and did what God told him to do, waited on the promise of the Lord and prayed, God honored him and let him be the keynote speaker on the day of Pentecost. The introduction, y'all, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon fallen man. What a phenomenal day in the body of Christ that you're preaching the sermon. And then on that sermon, thousands of men and women are saved and filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time in Jerusalem, y'all. You know that guy had to feel good about that. But he did not do that when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. You're wanting so much to do. You're wanting God to bless you. But you're not willing to do what he tells you to do in your prayer time. You're not honoring him in, your word, in the word by doing what he tells you. And because of that, you have no strength to carry out what God's put in your heart to do. James chapter 4 as we head this home. Isn't God good to us? I mean, he shares some stuff with us, just blows me slap out of the water. And I've been walking with him for a long time, even though I've only been on earth a short time. <laughs> James 4, verse 6. James writes, we're not to be friends with the world. Those who are friends with the world, Christian, are enemies of God. They make themselves enemies of God. And then he gets down to verse 6, and he writes this. But he, God, gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the who? Proud. When, when Peter was proud, did God resist him? Absolutely. He didn't back him up. He didn't affirm him. But God gives grace to the who? The humble. Therefore, submit to God. Then, once you submit to God, you will have the fortitude to resist the devil, and he will flee from the power of God that's on your life because you're submitted to God. See, 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 see we've got to get this in, in our spirit because there's some stuff coming down the pike. And if we're not submitted to God and honoring God, and God knows this, that's why God woke me up and said, preach this. Because there's fear. For two weeks, I've had different people talk to me from different places, whether it was social media, in the natural, or wherever, that, that let me know that people are getting fearful about something that's about to happen. And why is it that different people in different places are picking up on the same thing? How many sense of fear are growing right now? Come on, raise your hands. Look at this, y'all. Elizabeth, get this. Raise your hands. Come on. These people are picking up on the fear that is going on. This is demonic. It is a spirit of intimidation, and it's trying to rock the church of the living God. But if we'll be strong in the Lord, walk in the power of his might, this thing is not going to last. It's not going to stand, and it will not happen because those that are righteous are going to put a stop to it through our prayers. The fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous will avail much. The devil is a liar. Who does he think he is coming against the servants of the Most High God? Submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee. He's just a flea. Draw near to God. He will draw an out to you. Did they want to draw near to God at the Mount, of Sinai, Mount Sinai? No. They didn't want to cleanse their hands. They said, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Let your joy be to gloom, because joy comes in the morning. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Did he lift Peter up? Yes, he did. Man, alive. He lifted Peter up so much so the Catholic Church made him up there next to Jesus. I, it cracks me up. I go to funerals. They talk about Peter standing at the gate. Will Peter let you in? Peter is not Jesus. Amen. Matthew 7 says, Jesus will say to them who, who practiced lawlessness but said it was God telling them to do it, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. It doesn't say Peter says that.
You know why they associate Peter with dates? Have you ever thought about that? Peter's at the pearly gates. No. Matthew 16, Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? Then he says, who do you say that I am? And before Peter could even think about it, the Holy Spirit spoke through him and says, you're the son of the living God, you're the Christ. And Jesus said, upon this rock, and they think because he said that, and Peter is Petros, they said, well, he's going to build the church upon the rock and the gates. So we took tradition, because we don't understand revelation knowledge up in here, and we put him at the gatekeeper. The gates are not going to prevail. That's not what Jesus said. Amen or oh me. I love stomping on tradition. Because it sends people to hell. It's not the truth. It can't save you. So, if you live a submitted life, Lord, you don't have to live in fear concerning what man can do to harm you any longer. If you've honored him and you submitted to him, lay down and go to sleep. Don't fear it. God will cause his grace. See, he gives grace to the humble. That's why I'm humble. Don't act like it up here, but I really am. <laughs> God will cause his grace to come upon you. And that grace, not you, don't get that in your mind, it's you. That grace will cause your enemies to fear the presence of God on your life. They will fear you. You're afraid of them. They're over there shaking in the boots because of you. People who are submitted to God in their hearts and honor the Lord and His Word receive grace and compassion while those who dishonor God receive hardship and pain. It's the truth. It's the truth, y'all. Get two people. One lost, not connected to a body of believers in a church fellowship. Let them go into the hospital let them go up under the knife. Let them be treated by doctors and nurses. And it will be a hard situation for them. Let another person with the same situation in the same hospital, having the same doctors, having the same nurses, go up under there because of prayer and humility. And they will be loved. They will have compassion shown them. And everything will go well with them because God's presence is upon that person that has honored God. Mark my word, that happens every day. The same people that tell you that is the worst hospital. Those are the worst practitioners I have ever been in. The other people that are safe, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit and trust in God, they say that's the best hospital. Those are the best practitioners. It's the best place to go. I'd send my mom and them there because they've had the grace of God and the grace of God will cause your enemies to be at peace with you even if they don't like your faith. Boy, y'all getting a download today. The ways of a transgressor are what? We read that and we say, nah. And then we go out and live a hard life. Oh, the men were tough back in the day. They had to be tough because they didn't walk with God. It was hard on them. But let those who walked in God's presence, favor of God came upon them. And then people hated them because God's favor was on them. Amen or oh me? Ephesians 1, we're done. I mean 6, and we're done. Now, I hope you re remember all I've taught you today because you're going to have to go share it now. <laughs> Verse 1. Paul's writing to us a very important chapter, a very pivotal chapter in the New Testament. And he says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. He said, In the Lord, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. See, there's a benefit to honor God and his word. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your what? Masters. Yes, slavery is in the Bible. Because slavery was uh, prevalent in those days, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, obey 
your servants, in sincerity of the heart, as to who? Not the flesh, but to Christ. You're honoring God in your heart as you're obeying man. Are you hearing me? You've got to honor God while you obey Him. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the where? The heart. You're honoring God, and with good will, doing service as to the Lord, and not to men. You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for God, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from who? Not the people, the Lord. Amen or oh me? You remember Johnny Paycheck? Take this job and shove it. I don't want it anymore. You remember that? That taught us a generation how to dishonor our employers. Working nine to five. What a way to make a living. It's all taken and no giving. You know what that did? It told a bunch of employees, your boss is nothing but a, a, a thief robbing from you, so you rob from him or her, right? And what it did, it went against Ephesians 6. Because we were not honoring God in our heart, we were getting back at the man. Give it to the man, right? And what you did is you hardened your heart against God, and God couldn't bless you under that man. So that man got rich and you got broke. But if you honor God, God will move on him, and he'll cause him or her to give you a promotion and give you wealth that you did not earn because it was God's grace and favor on you. So get your attitude right. That was free. Now, let's move on. Employers, you're welcome. And you masters do the same. Now, he's already dealt with the servants. Now, he's dealing with the masters. God, no respect or person. It don't matter if they're in the Oval Office or the outhouse. They're all the same in his eyes. And you masters do the same things to them. I hate it for the leaders that are, are uh, using power grabs and usurping their own authority to do what they want to do and put us in misery because they're doing it against God and not us. Amen. Giving up threatening. Don't they threaten us? Yes, they're threat getting on television and threatening Christians, y'all. Our own governmental leaders. Knowing that your own master also in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies, methodologies of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. These are demonic spirits floating around that's, that's driving us in fear. We're going up against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, the Lord spoke specifically to me this past week about teaching his church how to be strong Lord and be able to walk in the power of his might. That's where we got to get in the evil day. That's what Paul's talking about in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand, right? So he wanted me to deliver this word. Today you have received the teaching that will empower you to do just that. Walk in the power of the Lord and in his strength. You cannot, Christian, be a hearer of the word and not obey it, James said. And think that you will receive God's grace to protect your heart from the spirit of fear in these last days. You can't be a hearer and not a doer and expect God's going to protect your heart from fear. It ain't going to happen, right? So we got that established. Do what God said. Paul taught on submission and authority and honoring it in the first part of this chapter on spiritual warfare. See, we, we, we make spiritual warfare so mystical, so spooky, and all it is is that's a distraction from what spiritual warfare is all about. Paul addresses it. Honor. Honor your parents. Honor your boss. Honor your master. Honor those around you. And honor God by honoring them. And then be strong in the Lord. What is this generation not doing? They're not honoring the government. They're not honoring their parents. They're not honoring. They just aren't honoring. And they're, they're getting eat up. Bad grammar, but you get it. Do you see why? When you dishonor. Meow. It causes your grace to lift. It causes hardship to come on you. It causes you to fear. 
Because you will feel alone when God said, I'll never forsake you. But you feel alone. How many feels alone? Don't raise your hand. Hand. So you cannot be a hearer and not a doer. You got to do the word. Then God will protect your heart from the spirit of fear. Paul taught on submission and honoring authority. We are to honor the spiritual position that people hold, even if they don't honor it themselves like our leaders are not doing right now. And God will honor us for honoring that position that they hold, even though they're heathens. Be spiritually astute, wise. Be spiritual mature. Understand that. You know their hearts are wrong. You know what they're doing is wrong. You know they're disgracing their own office. But you know that office, all authority is appointed of God. You honor that office. And if you honor that office, God will honor us. Even when they brought Paul into questioning in Rome, he treated them with dignity and respect, y'all. Peter tells us in his epistle, don't only be respectful to the good, but also to the harsh. Being submitted to Christ and honoring God, honoring his word, and those in authority will cause God to give you grace to walk in his power, the power of his mind, and to be strong in the Lord so that fear cannot cause you to run. Right? Be still. And if you will, you will see the salvation of the Lord. America, be still right now. Christians in America, be still. That's hard for Christians to do. If you will be still on the authority of God's word, he will show you his salvation from this. God will not, hear me well, y'all, I'm done. God will not give us over to the wrath of our enemies if we honor him in our hearts. This is a word of peace and assurance for somebody. You're going to leave here. You came here with fear. You watched in fear, but you're going to leave in faith. You're going to have peace because you honor God in your heart. You don't have to fear what man can do to you. Didn't God deliver the Jews from Pharaoh's wrath? Yes, he did. He buried Pharaoh in the water and all his men. Didn't God deliver Daniel and the three Hebrew men from the wrath of Nebuchadnezzar? Yes, he did. Didn't God deliver Esther and the Jews from the wrath of Haman and the gallows that Haman had built to hang God's people? Yes, he did. Did God deliver Noah and his family from the wrath during the flood? Yes, he did. Did God deliver Lot and his daughters from the wrath that was being poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes, he did. Do you see a thread, a commonality? That God always delivers the righteous before the wrath can be poured out. So we should fear who? God or man? We're not appointed under wrath. And we're, it's like we get over one scare tactic and then another comes. And, and, and they, you, know, you know they do this. Why do y'all watch them? Oh, it got quiet. They, they work that stuff. Coronavirus is the worst thing ever. And they just, they fed us hysteria, fear-mongering on how bad it was because they played on our ignorance of coronavirus. I think it's called COVID-19. That means there were other 18 other COVIDs before this one. Where were they? Why weren't they exploited? Oh, they found something new to exploit because we were ignorant of that one and they used that. And guess what? It had a shelf life. We got tired of it. We took our mask off. We came out of our hiding, hunkering in our bunker. We went to the store. We went down the wrong aisle. We showed them who was boss. And then they said, they're getting out of control. we got to find something else. See, we laugh now. 2020, we weren't laughing. We were hiding. Because it worked. You know what I did? I went in the upper room, my study. I said, God, we scared down here. What do you want us to do? 
He said, this is not a test of faith, it's a test of wisdom. Because my people are distract, destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Yeah. And he gave us wisdom throughout 2020, 2021. God's did, God has done some of the biggest, hugest miracles in our history in 2020 and 2021. Because we did not let fear intimidate us. It works, y'all. God will not give us over to the wrath of our enemies as long as we're honoring him. So they can go ahead and load up their little cannons, plot and plan all they want to. God is going to cause derision to come upon them. That's scripture, y'all. Elizabeth, please keep recording. I'm going to ask you to stand. Lydia. God is moving. Those that are watching, you've heard what the Spirit is saying. Perhaps you've been in fear. Perhaps you've been wringing your hand wondering what's going to happen. What's going to happen next? God's given you a sure word to give you assurance, not confidence, assurance that he will deliver you. What are you going to do with what you've heard? Continue watching. Father, I have obeyed your word. I delivered the message of peace, of hope, and of truth into the hearing of your people. May you cause this word to go like a seed into good ground and be hidden in our hearts that we might not sin against it. So that when the next big hooray that Satan tries to plot and plan through evil men and women in this nation and other nations, God, it will fall powerless to the ground. Because we will not buy into their lies. We will not be moved by their intimidation uh, tactics. We will be still and we will see the salvation of the Lord. That's what you've been waiting on. People wonder, where is the great moves of God? Where are the great acts of God like it's in the Bible? Well, if God could get some people to stand still long enough, he would do those great acts. But we, we run like, like ants, scared, to and fro, trying to find the next uh, snake oil. Be still. If you're here today, and you know that this is a word from God for you, and it has pierced your heart, and has caused peace to come into your heart and life. Raise your hand, please. Now use this word for assurance the next time that lying spirit comes to you and says something bad is about to happen. Say, I'm honoring God, I fear Him, and I resist you, you foul spirit. And God will bless you. God will strengthen you. And God will cause you to walk in His might and His power. Thank you, Lord, for these that have raised their hand. Your word will not return void just like you told us. It will accomplish what you sent it to do. If you're here today and you are not saved, if you were to die today and the wind in your lungs was to leave you and not return, do you know where you will spend eternity? Eternity will never end. That's why it's called forever. Never, ever, 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 never know what light and life and peace really are any longer to be eternally and permanently separated from God if you're not sure if you were to die today where you would spend eternity and you want to make absolutely positively sure with assurance from God through his Holy Spirit that you are born again and if you should die today you will make it to heaven raise your hand I commit it into your hands. I've obeyed you, Lord. I've cast the net. It's you, Lord, that has the increase. We bless you and we praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody say, ain't God good? Come on, give him praise.